Welcome to Chapter 17 Lecture, all about infectious diseases of the nervous system. One of my favorites, I think, just because I'm really into morbid diseases, and there's a lot of morbid ones. The ones affecting the nervous system oftentimes are very dangerous and deadly. And that's because our nervous system is pretty important and pretty central to our physiological functioning. The brain controls a lot of our vital organs. It is one of our most vital organs. So the brain and the spinal cord are the central command. We call them the central nervous system or the CNS. And then all the nerves that kind of shoot out of, off of the brain or off of the spinal cord are the peripheral nerves. So we've got cranial nerves in our head and face, and we've got all of the spinal nerves that, sh that stick off of the spinal cord and innervate the rest of our body. Um, these nervous tissues, brain, spinal cord, all the nerves are made up of specialized cells called neurons. They're really unique cells in the body. They have a very unique architecture or structure. So there's a cell body, which is sort of this fat part here with the nucleus. And then there's these branches that stick off the cell body, which are called dendrites. There's a long tail, which is called the axon. And then at the end of the axon are these terminal buds or termin terminal bulbs that, um, are, that form synapses and connections with other nerve cells. So the nerve cells are intricately connected to each other and they transmit signals from one to the other using electrical signals through ion channels and stuff. They actually literally generate electrical signals to um, send messages. So you can send messages from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. So sensory information goes from the body to the brain. You touch something hot or something hurts. You, that sends a message to the brain. The brain processes it and then tells your muscles how to respond to pull away, etc. Um, so the nervous system being so important to our body's functioning, we want to keep it safe and protected. So we surround those, the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord with bony structures. The, the, in the head, you've got the cranium, the skull, the bony skull that protects the brain. And in the um, back, you've got your vertebral column, um, the bones of the spine. And there's a column right down the center of it where your spinal cord flows through. So it's literally protected in a column of bone. The brain and spinal cord are also protected by um, a set of three membranes called the meninges. And the meninges are fluid filled. They're full of cerebrospinal fluid or CSF, which provides nutrients to the neurons, but also provides cushioning and protection so that the brain is not bumping up and chafing against the cranium. It's in floating around in this watery waterbed. <laughs> So um, some other protections that the brain has to keep it safe, um, in particular from infection, from infectious agents, is a specialized set, set of capillaries or system in the brain where the, the blood vessels are actually very tight. So there's a very selective permeability from the blood to the brain. It's called the blood-brain barrier. So less things, less chemicals will leave the blood and enter the tissue in the nervous system than in other parts of the body. And this is good. This is to protect the brain from potentially in, um, infectious uh, particles getting in there or even toxic chemicals from affecting the brain. But it can also be problematic in terms of treatment because it also prohibits antibiotics from entering the brain. If you do have an infection in the brain, the blood-brain barrier doesn't allow antibiotics through very well, and also even some types of chemotherapeutic agents. So brain cancers, brain tumors can be difficult to treat with chemo because the um, chemotherapy doesn't effectively get into the brain because it doesn't get through the blood-brain barrier. Because the brain is so sensitive, and um, we wouldn't want to have unnecessary inflammation in the brain. Like if you get a splinter in your finger, it's okay if your finger gets inflamed. So you're down one finger, you've got nine others you can use. You'll be fine, you'll be able to survive. But if you got a splinter in your brain and it became inflamed, right? first of all, we've got plenty of 
physical barriers to prevent a splinter from getting in the brain, but also if it became inflamed, that would cause, could cause significant physiological problems because the brain controls us. So the CNS, like your eyes, are immune privileged. They um, have a reduced amount of innate immunity and cytokine production because inflammation is not a good thing to have in the brain, especially if you don't need it. Um, so the specialized white, the, the macrophages, I guess I should say, of the nervous system are called microglia. So remember when monocytes leave the blood and enter the tissue, they differentiate into macrophages. And then macrophages have different names and different parts of the body and slightly different, like they look a little bit different, function a little bit different, but they still are big cells that will eat invading things. They can also eat dead cell and debris. So microglia are what we call the macrophages of the nervous system. So the nervous system is thought to be normally a sterile environment. There aren't thought to be any normal flora of the nervous system. Now, we may find with the Human Microbiome Project someday that there are maybe some viruses or non-culturable bacteria that do, in fact, sometimes live normally in the nervous system. But the Human Microbiome Project currently is not sampling that site because to sample the cerebrospinal fluid is pretty invasive. It requires a lumbar puncture, and you're not going to do that type of procedure just for a data mining experiment. You would only do that if there was clinical need to. So for now, we assume that the cerebrospinal fluid is sterile, and if any infectious particles are found there, it's because of an active infection. So this is just a nice image from the textbook that I like that kind of is a summary of everything from this chapter of all the different diseases of the nervous system and the different organisms that cause those diseases and what types of organisms they are. And I'm just looking through this list and we're going to talk about pretty much all of them. So yeah, by the end of the chapter, you'll know what they all are. So the first infectious disease or pathology of the nervous system that we're going to talk about is meningitis. So meningitis clinically is it's inflammation of the meninges, those membranes that surround the brain. So it's not the brain tissue itself. It's the membranes around the brain that are infected and inflamed. And the classic symptoms and signs of this disease are really bad headache, a stiff neck from um, inflammation at the top of the spinal cord or the base of the of the skull that can make it difficult to bend your head, a fever, um, nausea and vomiting due to just um, sort of like dizziness from the, the headache and um, photophobia, which means a fear of light or really it's a sensitivity to light. And there's a lot of different causes of meningitis. We're going to talk about all of these, Neisseria, Streptococcus, Haemophilus, and Listeria, the first four, are all bacteria. So back, we'll talk about bacterial meningitis. There's also a couple of types of fungi, Cryptococcus and Coccidioides are fungal pathogens. And then there's also a handful of viruses that can cause meningitis. Now, the most common form of meningitis is viral meningitis. If you've known anyone who had meningitis, it was most likely viral. And viral meningitis is also the most mild form. So a lot of times it doesn't require hospitalization. You just feel really crappy and you stay at home and you get better. The type that is most dangerous would be the bacterial meningitis. That is the most severe and most deadly form of meningitis and, um, and most concerning. Now, uh, nice, so we're going to talk about the biggest bacterial pathogen, the most concerning uh, causative agent of meningitis is called Neisseria meningitidis. So you know it's common cause of meningitis when it has meningitis in its name. Um, Neisseria is a gram-negative coccus. It's a diplococcus, so you can see these arrows pointing to the diplococci here, little two balls stuck together. All right, and it the since it's 
biggest disease that it causes is meningitis, we sometimes just call it the meningococcus. So there's a meningitis vaccine that a lot of people have to get before going to college. It's required for college. Some people just get a waiver and decide not to get it, but it is recommended in college because it's often associated with these um, sort of outbreaks that happen in um, dormitories, um, in military barracks, um, and even in schools, but definitely like residential housing facilities where there's lots of people living together. Um, so dorms being a big association. So that's why it's recommended before going to college. So um, it causes the most severe form of meningitis and one of the telltale signs that your meningitis is bacterial and caused by Neisseria meningitis is this rash. It looks like a rash, but really it's bruising. It's blood vessels that burst in the skin and they're called petechia, and it just looks kind of like a rash of bruises um, or burst blood vessels. And that is a classic sign of, of Neisseria meningitis. Um, part of what causes that those petechia is uh, an endotoxin is due to um, damage of the blood vessels by endotoxin which is LPS, that's characteristic of gram-negative bacteria. So um, another thing that other virulence factors of Neisseria that make it particularly virulent is it produces an enzyme called IgA protease. So it can, it can degrade IgA antibodies and render them ineffective at protecting you. They also have a capsule which um, makes them more resistant to phagocytosis. So your phagocytes don't very effectively kill them. So they can kind of get past the second line of defense pretty well. And then it takes a while for your third line of defense to ramp up. And in that time, they can do a lot of damage. So it can be really rapidly fatal. So treatment is needs to be started right away. There's a sort of a small window for treatment. Um, so how is it spread? If, it's, if it infects the central nervous system, that's not a portal of entry, all right? It's actually through um, like mucous membranes that the, that the bacteria infects the body and then it moves into the blood and it spreads to the nervous system. So it's usually not transmitted on fomites or surfaces, it usually requires direct contact between people. And so usually when you see cases of it, um, if you see multiple cases of it, it's in like a home or dorms or something like that where people are living close, close in contact with each other. The other thing about Neisseria meningitis is although it can cause these very dangerous infections, about 30% of the population actually just harbor this bacteria in their na nasopharynx, in their nose or throat, just like they just normally do. It doesn't make them sick, they're just colonized, and they're carriers. So that can also be problematic um, of asymptomatic carriers. So how, do, how is it treated? It is treatable, but again, you have to get treatment really early on. You've got to get early diagnosis. And sometimes that doesn't happen because, you know, you have a kid or, a, or you're a college student and you, you have a fever and a bad headache. So maybe you just down some ibuprofen and go to sleep and just, you know, call it a bad cold or a bad hangover. Um, when really it's meningitis. And so it's oftentimes not until people are really doing bad that they seek help and get the proper diagnosis. So the treatment for it, it is treatable with antibiotics. Um, penicillin G, which is the original penicillin, which is um, given intravenously. And um, the test for it is usually they'll do a test of, do like a nasopharyngeal swab to look for Neisseria meningitis but really more definitively, they need to test the cerebrospinal fluid itself because some people can just be carriers of Neisseria and it not actually cause an infection. So um, usually a CSF, a lumbar puncture will be done to sample the cerebrospinal fluid. And then they can do gram stain, they can culture it. Um, gram stains work really nice on cerebrospinal fluid because there really shouldn't be 
any other cells, you know, many other cells there. So bacterial cells really pop up. Unlike uh, maybe like a sputum sample where you would expect other, bat, you know, normal flora to show up in those. So um, the there is a vaccine, as I mentioned, for Neisseria meningitis. Oh, another thing I should mention is Neisseria meningitis is on the CDC's, um, what is it called? The threat report. There are strains of Neisseria meningitis that are popping up that are resistant to penicillin. So we're starting to get drug resistance, which is bad because this is a pretty dangerous infection if you can't, even when you can treat it, but especially if you can't treat it, it will be totally fatal. Um, luckily, we do have a vaccine. The vaccination program is not necessarily everyone. It's not like a childhood vaccine that you get in that first year or two of life. Those are pretty, have pretty good coverage. Meningitis vaccine is, is more optional um, that parents can opt to get their kids vaccinated at 11 years old. I take it back. I think that recently in the last year, it became mandatory in New York State. You have to look it up, but I it, and the rules will be different in different states um, and maybe even for different school systems. But um, I think with the emergence of antibiotic resistant strains, it makes the vaccine even really more necessary because we really need to work to prevent it since we're losing our grounds in terms of being able to treat it. So another organism, another bacteria, that can cause meningitis is Streptococcus pneumoniae. And we're definitely gonna see this guy again because as its name suggests, one of the things it really likes to cause is pneumonia. It's a respiratory pathogen, but it can sometimes escape the lungs and travel to the nervous system where it causes meningitis. So um, these are also gram positive, or sorry, not also, Neisseria is gram negative and Streptococcus is gram positive. So a simple gram stain can differentiate and distinguish whether or not it's Neisseria or Streptococcus causing the uh, meningitis. Some other things that can differentiate clinically between Streptococcal meningitis and Neisseria meningitis is that petechia rash. The petechia rash, we know it's nice, it's Neisseria. Um, streptococcus meningitis often occurs in people who either have pneumonia or recently had pneumonia. So that's another sign that it came from streptococcus pneumoniae. So it, since this bacteria usually causes its, its main disease that it causes pneumonia, we sometimes just nickname it the pneumococcus. So meningitis can be called by can be caused by meningococcus or by complications with pneumococcus. Um, so yes, so this one is another common cause of of meningitis of bacterial meningitis, and it's dangerous, not quite as dangerous though as Neisseria. Um, it's really important to distinguish whether or not somebody's bacterial meningitis is from Neisseria or Streptococcus because although they're both bacteria, one is gram negative and one is gram positive. So the drugs that you use to treat it are different. Penicillin is not a good choice for this one because it's gram positive. Um, no, Penicillin usually works well on gram positive. These ones are a little bit backwards, actually. So we learned in lab, penicillin usually doesn't work well on gram negative, but it does work well for Neisseria. And it usually does work well for gram positive, but it does not work well for, for strep pneumonia. So there you have it. Things don't always follow the right patterns. But um, there are other drugs that you can treat streptococcus pneumonia, pneumonia with, so it's still treatable with uh, antibiotics. There are also um, anti there are vaccines for streptococcus pneumoniae. This is not what's in the meningitis vaccine. This is what's in the pneumococcal vaccine. So there's two. There's one called Prevnar that is against seven strains of strep pneumoniae, and there's one called Pneumovax that's against 23 strains. So Prevnar is part of childhood vaccinations helps to prevent streptococcal 
pneumonia infections. And then there's also one for adults, especially older adults who might want to boost their immunity and prevent pneumonia. But it also pre prevents a type of potential type of meningitis. So it's another good one to get. Um, some of the virulence factors that strep pneumonia has is it has a capsule as well, just like Neisseria, which protects it against phagocytosis. And it also produces um, enzymes and chemicals that damage the nervous system tissue, the, the central nervous system, and can cause the brain cells to apoptose, which basically means to commit suicide. It kills them. So a third bacterial form of meningitis is caused by a bacteria called Haemophilus influenzae B, or HIB for short, standing for Haemophilus influenza B. And it's a gram-negative bacteria. It's a respiratory virus, so it's similar to Streptococcus. It normally enters the respiratory tract, but has a tendency or a tropism for nervous tissue and will find its way to the nervous system and cause meningitis. It was a major cause of meningitis in the 80s and early 90s, but in 1985, a vaccine came out for Hib, um, and it's often referred to as Hib, the Hib vaccine, and, um, and it drastically reduced the number of cases of Haemophilus influenza. You hardly ever see meningitis from Hib anymore. Most likely when you do, it's usually in children that have, are too young to have been vaccinated, like really tiny infants. So um, it's a widely used vaccine and it's not a terribly infectious organism. So it's very, very rare to see it now. Um, but it was a very big health coup in um, what developing that vaccine because it drastically reduced the incidence and prevalence of Hib meningitis. And then the fourth bacteria, there's four different bacteria that can cause meningitis, is Listeria monocytogenes. And as you may notice, we, some of these, a lot of these bacteria cause multiple diseases. Streptococcus pneumoniae is the pneumococcus. It causes pneumonia. We're going to see it again when we talk about diseases of the respiratory system, but it can also cause meningitis. Listeria monocytogenes is usually listed primarily as a gastrointestinal disease. It's a foodborne illness. You get it from eating contaminated foods, and it can cause like diarrhea and, you know, cramping, abdominal cramping. But Listeria is a unique bacteria, and it can actually escape. See, my image here is animated. These little black dots that are shooting around, those are Listeria inside of a cell. They literally have a mechanism of jettisoning themselves through the cell. And if you look at the edges, some of them actually are jettisoning out of the cell. And they can jettison out of one cell into another cell. And so this ability of them to sort of jettison through tissues means that they can also cross the placenta and they can cause a miscarriage. So that, where do I say that in my slide? Here we go. Pregnant women are especially susceptible because the microbe can jettison out of cells, it can cross the placenta, and it can infect the developing fetus and cause a miscarriage. So a lot of the food recommendations for pregnant women are things like don't eat undercooked meats, don't eat unpasteurized milk and dairy products, um, don't eat undercooked seafood, because those can be sources of listeria, which in a healthy person would, would cause a nasty um, gastrointestinal infection, but in a pregnant woman could lead to miscarriage. So that's why those foods are on the list for pregnant women. Um, scarily enough, we're finding it in more and more foods, including produce. And in 2011, there was a major outbreak in cantaloupe melons of listeria. And um, a whole bunch of cantaloupes were recalled. And it was kind of crazy because a lot of times when produce is contaminated, it's because the outer surface gets contaminated because of like manure or something like that. Um, so the surface of the fruit gets contaminated. But in this outbreak, they did studies and they found that the listeria was actually contaminating the inside 
of like that the fruit itself it was somehow growing inside the melon so um i was pregnant with my daughter the next year in 2012 and i would not touch cantaloupe because i was still terrified of listeria um so yes um meningitis can cause foodborne illness but can also lead to um, meningitis just simply to its due to its ability to jump around to different tissues it can cause these further complications um, some interesting things about listeria it likes cold te temperatures it's a bit of a psychrophile and so that's why you'll see it on some of these dairy um, it'll actually grow fairly well on refrigerated meats and dairy products so it's one of those organisms where refrigeration doesn't actually is not bacteriostatic it grows quite well at refrigerated temperatures. But it also means that when you are testing someone to diagnose listeria, they will actually put the cultures, um, the culture dishes not in an incubator, but in a refrigerator to grow the bacteria. There's also other rapid diagnostic tests like um, uh, that are used, like genetic tests that are used in the dairy industry to test for food safety purposes, dairy and meat will will test all of their batches of meat and dairy before going out to stores for things like salmonella and listeria and E. coli, which is why sometimes you hear about recalls, even though there hasn't been an outbreak, because the FDA requires food safety testing for certain things. Um, so the prevention is is just avoiding foods that are potential sources of listeria, undercooked meat, unpasteurized dairy. And if you do get it, antibiotic treatment does work for people, but it, it won't prevent um, the side effect of miscarriage in pregnant women, which is why it's still very important for them to stay away from those foods. Now for the fungal pathogens, there's really two fungal pathogens. The first one, Cryptococcus, is really an opportunistic pathogen. So it doesn't make healthy people sick, but it's a major problem for people who are immunocompromised. And it's a major pathogen in the AIDS population, people with AIDS. Um, it's often the cause of death actually in those individuals. So it's a fungus that is found in birds. Um, so like bird droppings, you know, birds poop on all over the place. We live in an environment full of birds and those bird fecal matter can get blown into whatever and you can breathe it in. So um, most of us don't need to worry about that, but people who are severely immunocompromised from um, AIDS or maybe from like a lot of chemotherapy, uh, they do succumb to this fungal infection and it is worrisome for them. It happens to have a tropism for nervous tissue and can cause meningitis. There are antifungals that are available to treat it, but it takes several weeks to treat because fungal pathogens are just more sort of advanced cells and so it takes a little bit longer. And for people who are immunocompromised, they're already, their bodies are already struggling. The other fungal pathogen is coccidioides. And coccidioides is a fungus that is a true pathogen. It can make even healthy people sick and cause meningitis. It is found in very specific regions of the US, dry, hot regions. So the southwest of the u.s is where you'll find it like in the desert and stuff um and so it's just found in the soil it's a soil fungus there so you be out for like a little desert hike and come back and end up with meningitis from breathing in spores of these these fungi the coccidioides so it's sometimes called valley fever um and it's actually fairly virulent. It starts, you breathe it in, it starts as a respiratory infection and you might like have a cough and, um, but it can spread to the brain or to the meninges and cause inflammation of the meninges. Kind of similar to streptococcus, streptococcus pneumoniae, it initially starts as a respiratory, but can potentially progress to meningitis. 
Um, and then the last type of meningitis are the viral meningitises, which are more mild and also more common. So most of the time meningitis is caused by a virus. Um, and it's sort of a uh, diagnosis of, I forget what you call it, we basically rule everything else out. So it's hard to po positively identify a virus that's causing meningitis. Basically, you're diagnosed with viral meningitis if you do a CSF um, test, you test the cerebrospinal fluid and you don't find any fungi or bacteria, then you know it's got to be a viral pathogen. So 80% of cases of meningitis are from a virus. Usually the type of virus is an enterovirus from the enterovirus family. And it's usually much milder. Only 1% of cases of viral meningitis are deadly, whereas it's more like 20% in some of those bacterial meningitis cases. And usually there's no treatment that's needed except to maybe, you know, some uh, treat the symptoms of pain and fever. But otherwise, you just kind of have to let it run its course. A subset of meningitis, there's a couple of pathogens that can specifically result in meningitis of newborns. And these are all pathogens that are transmitted from the mother's genitourinary tract to the fetus during birth. Um, so the top three are the ones we're going to talk about. Don't worry about Cronobacter. So Streptococcus agalactiae is more commonly known as group B strep or GBS for short. Women are tested for GBS, usually later in pregnancy, but I think even now, uh, I think now they bump it up and test you even earlier in pregnancy. Um, so GBS, group B strep, is not pathogenic to women. It's, um, it doesn't cause any problems of the genitourinary tract, but there have been several cases of it causing meningitis in a newborn. So if someone, a woman who's pregnant is GBS positive, the plan of action is to give her IV antibiotics during labor to kill the group B strep so that the newborn doesn't acquire group B strep meningitis. Um, or if there's a C-section, there's no need for those antibiotics. Um, e. coli is another common cause. Mm, don't know how many of you experienced this personally. And I wish I had a memory for statistics and numbers, but a majority of women poop when they give birth vaginally. That's just the truth. All the pushing, there's a lot of pushing going on. So it's not uncommon for babies to be exposed to some fecal matter during the birthing process. Usually their mothers, sometimes their own meconium, but um, it is a common cause of bacterial meningitis, particularly in um, preemies, premature infants. Listeria monocytogenes, if the woman, if the pregnant woman ate food um, that was contaminated late in pregnancy, the baby could be born with infected with the listeria meningitis. So that can also cause, um, or sorry, with the listeria monocytogenes, which can cause neonatal meningitis. Another one that's not on here is um, he, he, bleh, herpes simplex virus, HSV, can actually also cause neonatal meningitis. Um, so yeah. Next on the list of nervous system diseases is polio. The full name of the disease is actually poliomyelitis, but we mostly just call it polio. It is... Um, an, an acute infection of the spinal cord, and it can cause muscle paralysis. So we've actually eliminated the infection in the most of the world. I think the only two countries that still have it, Afghanistan and Pakistan, don't quote me on that, but um, UNICEF is really working hard to vaccinate all of these developing countries and get rid of it in the last couple of countries where it is actually still endemic. So there's a couple of vaccines for it. Pictured here is the oral polio vaccine, which is the one that's administered in um, developing countries. This is a picture of the virus itself, of its capsid. 
and this is a picture showing the um, route of transmission. It's actually an oral transmission route. We call this the fecal oral transmission route because it's shed in feces and then food or water gets contaminated with that fecal water and people eat it. So uh, that's actually how they get it. So with nervous system diseases, they're, they pretty much all have, um, they, a lot of them actually have different portals of entry because there's no, the nervous system itself is not a natural portal of entry. So usually, so it's either a respiratory virus or bacteria that finds its way to the nervous system. In this case, it's gastrointestinal, enters through the, through the um, stomach and intestines, but it doesn't actually cause gastrointestinal disease. It then just uses that as its portal of entry to get to the nervous system. And we'll also see ones that have a biting insect vector as the portal of entry. So there's a lot of different portals of entry in this chapter. Um, so initially, the symptoms are pretty nonspecific. So fever, headache, sore throat, whatever. You might have some muscle pain, some achiness, but that's not uncommon in a lot of things like the flu. Um, but the infection will spread to the central nervous system. It's neurotropic. These All of these um, organisms in this chapter have some neurotropism. They have a preference for the nervous tissue. And so there's two different types of disease that it can cause. It can cause non-paralytic disease where it invades the nervous tissue, but doesn't destroy it. So you will, you can have um, meningitis, you can have muscle pain and muscle spasms, but it goes away and you don't get paralysis. The paralytic disease invades the motor neurons and damages them so that you get flaccid paralysis, like a weakness or just non-functioning of the muscles because the motor neurons are not working. Um, and if it affects certain parts of the brain stem, then it can really cause, it can cause paralysis of the respiratory system and the diaphragm, and then you need mechanical ventilation. And that's what the iron lung was. It was like the first mechanical ventilator. Now we just use little like handheld ones or machines. Um, you don't need like a giant vacuum like this, but back when polio was epidemic, that there were whole wards of people in these iron lung machines, which I imagine would be very claustrophobic. So when the polio virus causes paralytic disease, if you look at these pictures here, it shows these neurons, um, and these are motor neurons, and they're connected to muscle, okay? But in pol what polio virus can do is it can um, destroy that motor end of the motor neuron. So you can no longer send a signal to contract the muscle. And so you get partial, you get paralysis. Unfortunately, though, it does not, fortunately or unfortunately, it does not destroy the sensory end of the neuron. And so you can still feel pain. You're not paralyzed like someone who has um, a spinal cord injury. They can't feel their legs. They also can't move their legs. But in people with um, polio, and post polio syndrome, this paralysis, they lose their ability to control their muscles, but they don't lose the, the sensation. And so they actually experience a lot of pain. They experience the pain of the muscles atrophying. Um, so it's really a, a very painful post disease sequelae. And it affects a lot of people who get polio. A quarter to a half of individuals who are infected with polio will develop this paralysis, including President. Uh, FDR, Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, and it can develop much late, like it doesn't develop necessarily right away. It's a sequelae of polio. So it can, ha it's a sequel, either happen months later, years later, even decades later, it can happen. So the treatment for polio, there is no drug to treat polio. There's no antiviral for it. There's just, you know, keeping the patient, like supporting their breathing, treating the fever or pain, um, what have you, and doing physical therapy to improve muscle control after the, um, in the paralytic side of the disease. The best defense we have against polio is of course vaccination. And we have 
um, eliminated polio in the U.S. Occasionally, um, a case will crop up from someone who traveled to an endemic region um, and developed, contracted it there, but there have been no cases that have been contracted in the U.S. in quite a while. The vaccine came out not that long ago, I mean, in the 1950s. So the first one came out in the 1950s that was developed by Jonas Salk, and that's the inactivated polio virus vaccine. And then um, someone named Sabin developed uh, an oral polio virus vaccine in the 1960s. So that one can just be taken. It's just like a solution and you just take a drop of it on your tongue. Um, that one is a live attenuated virus. And so it provides really effective immune response, but the problem is that it can occasionally mutate and revert back to a pathogenic strain and cause poliomyelitis disease. So it's not given in the US, it's not considered safe enough to give in the US, but it does, it is very effective and has a good shelf life. So it is used still around the world um, to vaccinate a lot of populations. Uh, now my favorite diseases are these amoebic diseases that cause meningoencephalitis. So it's inflammation of the meninges and the brain. Encephalo means brain. And these guys will give you nightmares. They gave me nightmares when I first learned about them. So the two to know are called Negleria fowleri and Acanthamoeba. Now both of these are just amoebas that live all over the world, like in, like go find a pond, you'll probably find Negleria or Acanthamoeba in it particularly warm ponds. They like warm environments. And um, so they're very prevalent on the planet. It's very rare that they actually cause an infection, but when they do, they will kill you. There's like no survivability of these infections. And what they do literally is they eat your brain. So Negleria, this is a fun one. This is not science fiction, y'all. Negleria is found in many freshwater sources, ponds, lakes, what have it, and they infect you through your nasal membranes. So when you jump in the water and the, and the water rushes up your nose, it can actually force and push the Negleria through the nasal membranes, and then they have pretty clear access to your brain from there. They're pretty close. So they migrate to the brain, and for whatever reason, they find the brain to be delicious. So they just start eating it. And uh, actually, I don't know if they really devour the brain so much, but they will find their way to the brain where they can settle and, and find nutritious sources of energy. And they elicit a ton of inflammation in the brain. So the brain freaks out and panics because it gets past that blood-brain barrier and gets its way into the brain. And so you end up getting just a bunch of inflammation. Um, the, the, the immune system tries to wall off the amoeba, but in the process actually damages the brain. And there's really no effective treatment for it. There's so few cases of it. There's not enough real, really enough studies to, sh to um, figure out how to treat it because there aren't many opportunities to treat it. So, so far, all of the treatments are pretty experimental. And I'm, I think like 98% of the people who have gotten Negleria fowleri meningoencephalitis have died. Um, the disease itself is known as primary amoebic meningoencephalitis or PAM for short. Um, and death occurs very quickly. So just in case you're like, already having nightmares and panic attacks about going for a swim in a freshwater environment, know that there has never been a case in New York State. The cases in the U.S. tend to be in warmer climates, so below the Mason-Dixon line with the exception of some cases in Minnesota. There have been, at least in this time period between 1962 when they probably first identified it, and 2014, so this is like six years old, um, there were 149 cases and a total of three survivors. There might have been, there have probably been a handful more cases since then and maybe one more survivor. And those survivors were pretty lucky and on some kind of experimental treatments. So 
I guess the moral of the story is if you go to Florida or Texas, be real careful if you're swimming in freshwater uh, ponds and lakes there. Or wear a nose clip as it gets in through the nasal membrane. So as long as you're pinching your nose or wearing a nose clip or a um, like a snorkel mask that protects your nose or just, you know, keep your head above water, then you're safe from Nigleria fowleri. And there are some sources of water well, that actually have signs that say, you know, there's uh, Nigleria here, so keep your head above water to prevent amoebic meningitis. So although Nigleria is found almost everywhere in freshwater environments, it's still incredibly rare to actually get that infection. Just really unlucky if you do. The other kind of amoeba that can cause meningoencephalitis and eat your brain is acanthamoeba. And if you have been paying attention, you will know we have seen this already in the last chapter when we talked about um, infections of the eye. So acanthamoeba is the one that often gets in your eye, if you're a contact lens wearer and you don't properly clean your contact lenses, you can end up with a canthamoeba that infects the cornea and destroys the cornea of the eye. Well, it can also travel to the optic nerve in the back of the eye and travel to the brain, get access to the brain that way, and cause almost the same disease, just a little bit longer. And it's just as deadly, um, still pretty rare disease but oftentimes crops up in contact lens wear. So that's really a big indicator and really something to be very careful about. Again, only 2% two, 2 of people have survived. There's only been 400 cases of it ever worldwide. I think there's been more cases of it affecting the cornea, but it's still, it's very rare for it to progress to the brain, but it has and it can. And hopefully none of us are unlucky enough to ever have that happen. Okay, so moving on from those brain-eating amoebas and the last disease of the nervous, no, one of the middle diseases of the nervous system here is encephalitis. This is inflammation of the brain specifically. So this image down here is showing you we've talked about meningitis, which is inflammation in this red area here, just of the meninges around the brain and the spinal cord. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain tissue itself. And then those amoebas cause meningoencephalitis, which is inflammation of both. So encephalitis is inflammation of the brain, which is more serious than inflammation of the meninges. The meninges surround the brain, causes a lot of pressure and headache and head pain. But inflammation of the brain itself can cause all kinds of problems. Um, it can cause loss of consciousness, confusions, seizures, and loss of other sensory processes. So in addition to those same symptoms that you get with meningitis, the headache and the neck stiffness. Encephalitis, um, encephalitis is, is almost always caused, at least in an infectious way, by viruses that are transmitted by biting insects usually mosquitoes, sometimes ticks. So that's my little picture here showing you a mosquito and a tick and a virus to help you remember. So these are called arboviruses. That's just short for anthropod-borne viruses. Insects are anthropods. So they're pretty much almost always the cause of encephalitis. So some of these are Western equine encephalitis. And this one's actually um, in Western United States and in Canada. Eastern equine encephalitis is actually endemic to New York, um, the eastern, eastern seaboard of the U.S. California encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile encephalitis. So they all have encephalitis in their name and they're all viruses and they're mostly transmitted by mosquitoes. And the reason that they are restricted to these different areas or named after these different areas is because different Mosquito populations live in different areas and those mosquitoes carry specific types of viruses. Mosquitoes don't travel as much as humans do. They, they're, they're flying insects. You think they could, you know, hitch a ride from California to New York, but they usually don't. They kind of stay in their endemic regions. <laughs>
Um, another type of encephalitis uh, that can happen is, um, oh, so I misquoted earlier. I said that herpes simplex can cause neonatal meningitis. I was wrong. It can cause neonatal encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. So, but it's another STD that we have to be worried about in pregnant women because it can affect the nervous system of the newborn. Um, JC virus is is not a big one. It's a pro it's problematic in people with AIDS who have really depleted immune systems. Um, but cases of AIDS are going down with successful chemotherapy of HIV infection. So we're seeing um, JC virus less and less. Um, another type of encephalitis, so the types we were talking about before with the arboviruses, those are acute encephalitis. So it causes um, short and severe disease. Subacute encephalitis takes longer to emerge and is less severe in symptoms, but can still be ultimately fatal, just more slow progressing. So the three types of subacute encephalitis are toxic, caused by Toxoplasma gondii, which is a protozoan, and um, there's subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, or SSPE, which is a sequelae of measles, a very rare sequelae of measles infection, but still back in the day when, um, you know, basically the entire population of the world used to get measles as a kid, that one in a million chance was still, you know, probably several thousand kids a year that would die of this. Now it's very rare because measles is pretty rare. Prions are um, an infectious protein that can cause specific types of encephalitis. So toxoplasma, that's a fun one. You've already heard about it earlier in the course in one of your TED Talks when we were talking about parasite mind control. So toxoplasma being an organism that affects the nervous system is also suspected of affecting animal behavior um, as well. So toxoplasma most of the time is a pretty quiet infection. It's asymptomatic or mild. Maybe you get a little fever, a little lymph node enlargement, a sore throat. Um, but it can be fatal in people who are immunocompromised. It's also teratogenic. It's very dangerous for pregnant women to get. Um, they can transmit it to the fetus, which is not good. So it can result in miscarriage or stillbirth or, or other developmental um, problems in the fetus. The um, agent of transmission are cats. It's actually a normal pathogen. It's a parasite that, that is the ultimate host is cats and it can go through many intermediate hosts in the, pro in the process. So um, in that TED Talk you watched, it talked about how they've done experiments and shown that mice or rats that are infected with toxoplasma show less fear behaviors towards cats. Like they don't avoid this like areas of the cage that are doused in cat urine and they have more, um, uh, I guess they're less afraid of cats and so they're more likely to be eaten by cats and that's thought to be potentially some mind control happening from toxoplasma that's that's in influencing and increasing its ability to transmit to its reproduct the, ho the definitive host the cat so this is just a life cycle showing you some life cycle here of a cat so the cat is ultimately the host that the um, toxoplasma completes its life cycle in. So the cat gets it from its prey, birds or rodents, and um, those cysts hatch in the cat and um, are shed in the feces. And then potentially rodents and birds would pick up those eggs from the feces and this life cycle will continue. Well, these oocysts are not particularly picky about their mammalian hosts so they can get picked up by cattle or pigs and then people can get it from eating undercooked meat it can be can it can contaminate food or water sources where we can get it but the most common source of human transmission is from pet cats if a pet cat is positive for toxoplasma and you are handling the fecal matter of the cat by scooping the litter box and then maybe not washing your hands properly after words, then you can become uh, 
contaminated. So you get it through the fecal oral route, the feces of the cat going into your mouth orally from poor hand sanitizing. So pregnant women are often advised not to change kitty litter. It's okay to still have a cat, but don't come into contact with the litter and wash your hands after petting your cat, that kind of thing. Um, the last type of organism that causes nervous system disease that is infectious are these prion diseases. Now prions are interesting if you may or may not recall way back in chapter like, I don't know, three, we talked about prions and prions or prions, tomato, tomato, um, are proteins, they're, they're normal proteins that exist in your nervous system that just decide one day to, to refold into a different shape. And that different shape happens to be toxic. Um, it also has this, so this new shape of protein will go around and tell other proteins to refold into that toxic shape. So I like to call them zombie proteins because a zombie is like a person who's normal and then they die, but they're undead. And then they go around and they can attack living people and turn them into zombies. So the prions are like the zombie proteins. They um, were normal and then they became mutated and then they go around and mutate others just like them. So some prion diseases are very slow progressing and some are very quick progressing. And um, the thing about these prions is they basically, the way they cause pathology is they clump together and, and then they like kind of, basically the, the clumps they form are toxic to the cell. So they cause cell death. So the diseases they cause are called spongiform encephalopathies. If you look at this, section of brain tissue, all of these white bubbles are dead spaces. They're plaques. They're areas where the cells have died because the prions caused the cells to die. So um, it's hard to diagnose. The diagnosis of this disease is based on clinical presentation and then autopsy because you can't sample or biopsy somebody's brain tissue. Um, to look for it. You can only wait until they die and then you cut their brain and see those spongy things. So um, the most common form of spongiform encephalopathy that we know is mad cow disease, which happens in cattle. There's also scrapie in sheep is a type of spongiform encephalopathy. In humans, if you consume mad cow disease, like if you consume beef from a cow that had mad cow disease, you can get that prion disease and it um, presents itself as something called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So people can also develop this organically. So the human form of mad cow disease is called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Some people are genetically prone to it. Some people get it from eating um, prions from cows or they can get it from coming into contact with somebody uh, like us. Like, um, you can't catch it from someone like breathing it, but it can be transmissible by blood. So if your surgeon did some brain surgery on someone who had Creutzfeldt-Jakob prion disease and didn't know it, and then use those same surgical tools on another brain surgery, they could actually transmit the disease. There's no way to um, sterilize. There's no disinfection or sterilization procedure that is sufficient. So if a patient has prion disease and you do some kind of surgery on them, those surgical tools have to be thrown away. There's no way to properly sterilize them. Um, they're pretty uncommon as a transmissible. They're, they're very not contagious between person to person. Basically, you have to transfer brain material. Another version of this disease that's not on this slide here is called Kuru. And it's one of the first um, spongiform encephalopathies that was discovered in a cannibalistic tribe of people, Aboriginal people, I forget in what country. And it's um, in this tribe, they're not cannibals in the sense that they like hunt each other down and eat each other. It's, um, it's a funeral practice. So when a loved one dies, 
it's tradition for them to take the brain of the person and cut it up and eat it. Like all of the loved members of the family will basically eat a person of the deceased brain, a piece of the deceased brain. And it's kind of sentimental if you think about it, because like, who are like, what part of our body really is us embodies us. And that's like our brain, like your personality comes from your brain. So like, if you want to keep a piece of your mom with you forever after she dies, you eat a piece of her brain. That's like, that's the thinking in this, in that culture. And um, it sounds gross to most of us, but it's a, it's a very sentimental ritualistic process. It's not cannibalistic in the usual sense of the term, but they would do, often develop this disease called Kuru, where you kind of, I mean, some of the symptoms, by the way, um, of these diseases, I mean, you're basically losing chunks of your brain, your brain's deteriorating. So it's kind of like dementia. You start um, losing, uh, becoming confused, maybe developing um, tremors, maybe uh, losing different motor skills. It depends what areas of the brain are affected. So it's a little bit different in different people. But um, so, yeah. There's no treatment for it, basically just like hospice treatment, palliative care for people with prion diseases, but it is also fairly uncommon. And then my favorite of all is rabies. So rabies, I think is, I don't know, my, I don't know why it's my favorite. It's because it's so morbid and it's so untreatable and, and so historical. So Rabies is a zoonotic virus. You get it from animals it being bitten by an animal that has rabies. It's transmitted through the saliva. So the bacteria, when it enters through a bite wound, it is neurotropic. It finds its way to the nerves and it ultimately travels to the brain. And then it will travel to the, so some of it will live in the brain, but some of it will um, live in the salivary glands and replicate in the salivary glands. And that's how it's transmitted is through the saliva through bites. So one of the things that rabies does, or a lot of the, uh, the symptoms of rabies actually um, are some of those mind control things that help to transmit the virus. So one of the classic symptoms of rabies is called um, hydrophobia. In fact, the disease used to be called hydrophobia. Like this is an ancient disease, like in ancient texts, you can find um, cases of animals or people having hydrophobia, a fear of water, particularly drinking water. So animals or people who have rabies, they can't drink water. Like their throat will like close up, they start coughing. They don't, they literally don't have any desire to drink water you would think would make them feel very thirsty and dehydrated, but they don't because they're producing lots and lots of saliva because the, the virus, you know, encourages that so it can be spread. And if you were to drink water, then you would wash all that saliva down your throat and you'd wash all that virus away. So somehow the virus knows where the thirst mechanism is in the brain and targets it to make you not thirsty and in fact not want to drink water which is weird and crazy, but a very consistent symptom of the disease. Um, another thing it does is it makes that characteristic foam around the mouth. And that's again, all the extra saliva production due to the virus replicating in the salivary glands. And then another thing that it does in terms of brain control is it, it generates feelings of aggression. Rabid animals and even rabid people are very aggressive and they want to bite. They often engage in biting. And again, that is how the virus transmits itself. So somehow it tricks you into not wanting to drink water and wanting to bite people. And in that way, it gets itself transmitted. Rabies is a very slow moving infection, but once you start having symptoms of it, in other words, once it's reached the brain, it is not treatable and you will die, it, like 100% fatal if it reaches that point. So um, it's a very promiscuous virus in the sense that pretty much all mammals can be infected with rabies. 
And so this is just a map of the U.S. showing the animals that are most responsible for transmitting rabies in different areas. Um, all of the states, you'll notice, have dots. And the dots are because of bats. And I think this has come up in class before where we've talked about if you've had a bat in your house, you've probably had a rabies vaccination. Um, because a lot of it's very common for bats to carry rabies and bats also have these tiny little teeth and so if they bite and they're nocturnal so a lot of times they get into a house at night and they might bite you in your sleep but you don't feel it because it's a pretty small bite wound and then you wake up in the morning and there's this bat in your house and like how did it get in here you have no idea that you've been bitten so sometimes they encourage you to catch the bat and bring it in for testing because if they can find that it doesn't have rabies, then you don't necessarily, you don't need to get the rabies shots. But most of the time, if you have found a bat in your house, you woke up and there was a bat in your room, they recommend that you get the rabies vaccines because if, if it did have rabies and you did get bit and you didn't know it, you will die. So um, bats are definitely something to be wary of. Uh, where we live in New York, raccoons are also carriers. Again, rabies causes extra aggressive behavior and strange behavior. Raccoons are nocturnal by nature. So if you see a raccoon out in the day, that's probably not a good sign, especially if it has foam around its mouth, extra saliva production, or seems extra ex um, excessively uh, aggressive. Um, in the U.S., cases of rabies are pretty rare because um, getting bit by these different types of wildlife is pretty rare and because mainly because we vaccinate our pets. Dogs and cats are the animals we have the most contact with and we vaccinate them so that they don't catch it from potentially coming in contact with wild animals. And we also have, you know, access to healthcare and rabies vaccines if you do find yourself bit by a raccoon or a bat. However, in other countries where they don't have good animal control, where they don't have vaccination programs for domesticated animals, and where they don't spay and neuter dogs and cats, so you just have a lot of stray dogs and cats wandering around the cities. I don't know how you, where you guys have traveled to, but I went to Greece. Um, in my early 20s and there were stray dogs just like lying outside of restaurants just on the streets and stray cats too like so in some countries they really don't have good control and those dogs are obviously not vaccinated and they're free roaming so they can get rabies from wild animals and then bite people on the streets so there's actually about 50,000 cases of rabies still globally per year it's still pretty big disease, just not so much in the U.S. There's maybe like 50 cases a year or something in the U.S. So I keep saying like it's 100% fatal, you're totally going to die from rabies. Um, but you don't have to if you get vaccinated. So this is a vaccine that's not usually given. It's unique because not everyone gets needs to get vaccinated for rabies to prevent it. It's a vaccine that's actually therapeutic. So because it take it can take several weeks, you can ink the rabies virus can take several weeks from the time you get bit to, until the symptoms start. That is a window where you can um, give the vaccine, induce an immune response and fight off the rabies virus before it gets to the brain. You can also treat people with IVIG so human rabies immunoglobulin so from people who had rabies basically um, they extracted immunoglobulins and they can give it to you via uh, intravenously to um, neutralize any of the rabies virus as it tries to migrate to the brain um, people who work with animals like uh, veterinarians and and lab animal techs veterinary techs a lot of times they'll get the rabies vaccine prophylactically like because they're working with animals and the, they're very likely to get exposed to rabies so you just give them the shot in vet school um, this is Louis Pasteur over here my favorite microbiologist who uh, invented the rabies vaccine and this is the first boy getting the rabies vaccine he was a 
I, so um, Louis Pasteur was French, and I think this boy was named Joseph, and he was German. And he got attacked by a neighbor's do by a rabid dog, and his mother was desperate because you know everyone knew in those days you get attacked by a rabid dog and you're gonna die. And so she saw an article in the newspaper about Louis Pasteur developing this vaccine, and she was like, "You have to give it to my son." This was like the opposite of an anti-vax mom. This was like, I don't care that the vaccine's never been tested. You have to give it to my son right now. And she drove, she, you know, took a train or something all the way to France and she knocked on his door. And there he was. He got the vaccine and he survived. And he grew up, I think he actually worked for Louis Pasteur um, when he grew up. So they stayed close. Um, and it's still that same vaccine that we use today. So that's rabies for you. I guess another thing I'll say about rabies is um, the time it takes for the virus to get to the brain also depends on where you get bit. So if you get bit in the leg, you've got a little more time than if you say get bit in the head, then you really need to rush to the ER and get, get yourself a rabies vaccine. Um, Okay, so then the last two that we're gonna talk about are tetanus and botulism, which are two similar but different diseases. So they're both caused by clostridium bacteria and clostridium are gram-positive endospore formers. So they form these spores in the environment that can then germinate once they get into your body tissues. So tetanus is caused by clostridium tetani and it's an anaerobic bacteria. So it's, it forms these spores in soil. You can find it like in soil and um, dirt. And so if you get a puncture wound, and it's usually the deeper ones are um, more dangerous, but even in a shallow cut or puncture room, you can get, if it gets dirt in it, um, the tetanus spores, the clostridium tetani spores can germinate and start to grow there. Um, and uh, especially if there's poor circulation to that tissue, there's not a lot of oxygen coming to it. So like diabetics who have poor circulation to their feet, even a wound can, a wound can easily become infected with tetanus. Um, so the danger of Clostridium tetani is that it produces a toxin, a neurotoxin. So the bacteria itself doesn't go to the nervous system. It will stay in the foot, but it will produce a toxin that goes into the blood and the circulation and enters the um, the the nervous system. It, it it travels to the nervous system and affects the nervous system. And it it's a neurotoxin that causes muscle contraction. So like just contract all your muscles right now. You'll be super tense and tight, and that's what it feels like to have tetanus. So when the muscles of the face contract real tight, it causes this like weird grimace or smile. So that's called the sardonic grin of tetanus. And that you can see it in this picture here of this guy's face. It's called lockjaw because your jaw is all tight and locked. So lockjaw is a sign um, of tetanus. And this is a uh, complete tetanus spasm of the whole body causes like an arching of the back a straightening extension of the legs and arms and that's really progressed severe progressed tetanus um, tetanus is very rare now because we do have a uh, vaccine for it um, it's a multi multi-bacterial vaccine called the dtap well there's two there's the dtap and the tdap D is for diphtheria, T is for tetanus, and P is for pertussis, and the A is for attenuated, it's attenuated pertussis. So the T is the tetanus component. Um, and so that's really prevented most cases of tetanus. And you do need to get a booster. Your immunity to tetanus does wear off after about 10 years. So every 10 years, you do need to get a new tetanus shot. Um, a lot of times people won't keep up with that, but then if they get like, you know, a puncture wound and they go in for to the ER, the ER will say, when was your last tetanus shot? And if it was more than five or 10 years ago, they'll give you another one just to make sure you don't get tetanus. If someone does get tetanus and there was a little boy who got it a couple of years ago, um, 
in like Wyoming or somewhere out west and he was playing like on some farm equipment and he got a cut and um, he developed tetanus and he almost died because his parents were anti-vaxxers and they didn't get him vaccinated and the doctors the doctors who treated him were like they had never seen a case of tetanus before because it's really that rare that people get it because of the vaccine so effective and um, the sad part of the story is that um, the kid well the kid did recover but the parents still refused to vaccinate their child even after going through this horrendous experiment experience of their kid almost dying the treatment is tetanus antitoxin so basically antibodies against the tetanus toxin are given um, I, IV intravenously. Um, botulism is also caused by a clostridium bacteria, an anaerobic spore forming bacteria that can be found in the soil. Um, but this one is not got, you don't get botulism from a puncture wound, you get it from ingesting it. So it causes, it infects through the gastrointestinal tract. And the most common sources of botulism are canned foods because, again, it's an anaerobic bacteria, so there's no oxygen in a can. So if some spores get into the can and it's not sterilized properly, the bacteria can grow in there. Um, honey is another source because it's a spore that's in the environment. Bees can pick it up in soil and water, and it can get incorporated into the honey. And so it's why you aren't supposed to feed honey to babies because the infectious dose for babies is pretty small. Um, for adults, it's larger, so I'm not sure there's any cases of adult botulism from honey consumption, but there are cases from infant consumption of honey. So don't give honey to infants that are yet less than a year old. Um, so you consume the spores, they germinate in the stomach, and it's not the bacteria that are dangerous, it's the toxin they produce. So they produce this toxin, it gets absorbed across the intestines into the blood, and it causes muscle paralysis, systemic muscle paralysis. And that particularly compromises the respiratory system, you can't breathe, and you die. So fun fact about botulin toxin, it's an incredibly potent muscle paralytic, and we've actually isolated it and we use it cosmetically. That's what Botox is. Literally Botox is short for botulin toxin. And so it's diluted and injected in very small amounts into select muscle groups to paralyze them. Wrinkles, one of the things that causes wrinkles is muscles contracting. So if you prevent those muscles from contracting, then you don't get the wrinkles anymore. So there's a lot of joke memes out there about people who have too much Botox in their face that like every expression looks the same when they're happy, sad, mad. They look the same because they just basically lost their ability, like their whole face is like paralyzed. But Botox is actually used therapeutically as well. There are some migraine treatments that involve injection of Botox into muscle groups in the head that are thought to cause migraines by spasming. There's also some bladder disorders where the bladder, overactive bladder, where there's muscle spasming of the bladder. So selective injection of Botox into the bladder can, can improve that condition. So, so there's some cosmetic uses, but also some therapeutic uses of it. But as a disease, you really don't want to get it because it's really a potent toxin. And um, the, the treatment is, again, you have, to, you have to neutralize the toxin with antitoxin, antibo inject antibodies that neutralize the toxin because it's not the bacteria so much that's the problem, it's the toxin it makes. Um, and you've got to make sure you support the respiration of the patient until that toxin is cleared from their body. So they do need to be hospitalized and they can die. There's a 5% mortality rate. It causes the opposite effect of tetanus. So tetanus causes muscle contraction. And this is a famous art piece of some of a soldier with tetanus who's just fully contracted. All of his muscles are contracted versus a baby with flaccid paralysis of botulism. And they're just limp. Like 
it look they look like they're asleep and they're limp but they're not they're awake and they just have no muscle tension so you hold them and they just no muscle tone and that's the end of this chapter <laughs>